1 Corinthians chapter 1. Are you ready for the Word of God? As is our custom here at Livingstone Family Worship Center, we read the Word of God and we stand in reverence and honor of reading the Word of God to, to express to the Most High God that we, 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 we reverence His Word, um, that we truly believe that it is His inspiration unto us. And so with that in mind, beginning with verse 27 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I want you to listen to these words. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things, which simply means insignificant or lowly, the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God. And the righteousness and the sanctification and redemption that it is written. He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, once again, we honor you and we magnify you. We know that we're not here by mistake. That every person that has made their way here has been ordained of God to be here today. Father, I'm grateful that they have responded to the leadership of the Holy Spirit and have united together with us that we may worship you. For that person, Father, that is here today that needs answers, that is seeking responses from you, Father, I pray that you would once again use me for your glory, that you would speak through me for the benefit of those that are assembled in this room. We magnify you, we honor you, we glorify you as we worship and lift up your Son. To you, Father, be all the glory. For we pray in his name, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray. Amen. 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 As I read to you those, those words from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, I, I believe that there are some tremendous principles that can be found in this portion of Scripture. I've come to the realization that there are, at the very least, two distinct perspectives of the world. A world that believes in the existence of God. Those that respond to the truth of the Word of God. And there's the side that simply rejects the truth of the Word of God. I can include those that doubt, those that question. But in reality, the Word of God truly does define from the perspective that either, either you're with God or you're not. Either you are or you're not. And because there are different perspectives, there are different methods in which humanity endeavors to understand the circumstances that occur. One of the emphasis that we've been presenting to you over the past number of weeks is how we find ourselves in situations even today with life as it stands even today. And so with that in mind, I, I'm going to ask you just uh, three simple questions for you to ponder as we go forward. And, and, and hopefully we can identify ourselves in, in such a way that we can receive from these verses uh, that, that, that hit us or, or impact us right where we are individually right where you are, right at this very moment in time. And so to invoke that response within your own mind and your own thoughts, I'm going to pose to you three questions that I want you to ponder for yourself, that I want you to think about for yourself, that, that I want you to determine as to whether or not they apply to you. Number one, have you ever wondered 
how God could be working through that situation in your life, whatever that situation may be. And once again, I want you to, in the recesses of your mind, I, I want you to, to, to ponder these questions and to determine, do they apply to your way of thinking, to your, 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 your worldview even today, how you respond to life even today? from a godly perspective or from the perspective of, of a world that simply rejects the truths of the Word of God. So once again, have you ever wondered how God could be working in that or through that situation in your life, whatever it may be, and that situation being whatever it is that is capturing your attention, whatever it is that, 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 that even now is in control of your thoughts and in your mind. Number two, have you, have you ever been in a place because of life, because of circumstances, because of situations, because of what has occurred in your life. Have you ever been where you find yourself asking once again, could God truly be involved in my life in this situation? Something for you to once again ponder. To some, it might be a, a matter of, of catastrophe, or it might be something that is, is just something that you did not expect to occur, or, or something, once again, that has left this, uh, despondency, despair, frustration, deprivation, whatever the word may be. Where, God, are you in this situation? And number three, a very important and profound question for those of you that responded in the affirmative to the two previous questions or even one. Number three, how can you get beyond your current situation? Whatever it may be, that thing, that circumstance, that situation, that problem, that dilemma, that burden, whatever it may be, where you find yourself right now in that situation that for whatever reason seems to be controlling your life, your mind. Can you ever get beyond your current situation? Three questions that I want you to ponder right now in your life. As I read to you, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I, I want you to understand the, the, the profound interpretation or what this is trying to say as we read these words. Notice what it says. Once again, as, as I just touch on it briefly, notice, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. For the next few minutes, I'm going to minister you from a message entitled, The Foolishness of God. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And with that in mind, notice what he said, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, which seemingly goes to, against our, our nature to, to think that God would choose anything other than what we deem as being of God to fulfill his master plan or his will. But yet notice what it says once again, that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised has God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. What this is simply saying is that God often responds and reacts in a way that is contrary to what we believe or what we think or what humanity would think that it would be of God but God responds to the contrary. But there's a reason why, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Notice, but of him are you in Christ, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. In other words, once again, reminding us, giving us the, the inclination, the, the, the belief that in Christ there is wisdom. There is righteousness, there is sanctification, and there is redemption through the Son of the living God. Well, most of us understand today, as we have taught so often in the past, of the sovereignty of God. Believing that, that, that God does everything in accordance with His own will. So we believe in the sovereignty of God. How many believe that, that the God that we serve is in control even today? 
In spite of situations, in spite of circumstances, we believe in the sovereignty of God, that He responds according to His own divine will. And we believe in the providence of God, that He determines how, how His divine will or sovereignty will occur, that He orchestrates His divine master plan, that God is in control. So, so today, this morning, I want to remind you quickly of some of what we can come to know or have come to know as the attributes of God that we can understand in terms of who He is in His divine nature. And so with that in mind, I'm going to give you just a few of these. I, I have a number. Of, I'll see how it leads and where it goes. But uh, for, for those of you that are questioning or wondering, God, can you really be involved in my situation? Uh, God, how is it that, 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 that I can find myself here? Are you really working through my circumstances? How can I ever get beyond where I am right now? Let me remind you a few of the attributes of our God. How many believe this, this morning that the God that we serve is infinite? That He goes beyond our clear understanding? That, that He is self-existing and without origin? Now, I've come to the realization that, that that is probably one of the most difficult areas to understand of the attributes of God, that He is without origin. But in Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, listen to what it says. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Psalm 147, 5. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. So we understand that, that, that the God that we serve is, is, is infinite, that, that he is self-existing and without origin. Now, what I had in, intended to do is to remind you of some of the areas of the Word of God as it pertains to ourselves and our relationship with God. And I was going to give you four verses of Scripture. And Brother Marshall, actually, actually to show that we are in harmony, I'm going to show you how the Spirit of the Lord God works. So, so let me go back just, just, just for a moment and give you four areas of, of Scripture that I want to see if, if you can affirm this, these, these scriptures in your own mind and in your own mindset as it pertains to your relationship to this God, this, this self-existing God, this God who is infinite. So, so tell me if you respond to this in your life. Number one, once again, Isaiah 1, verse 19. Listen to this. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. That is found in the book of Isaiah as it was rendered to God's covenant people. But listen to the principle that is here. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. How many believe this morning that that verse can apply to your life? That if you are willing and obedient to the things of God, that you will eat or shall eat the good of the land. In other words, you shall receive, you shall experience whatever it is that our God, who is so good, has in store for you. Do you believe that? Number two, Psalm 103, two. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. That verse was rendered to us by Brother Marshall. And, and notice what it says here once again. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. How many believe today that there are benefits for the child of God who is in communion with the living God? Do you believe that? That there are benefits Number three, Psalm 84, 11. Listen to what it says here. And I want you to, to, to gravitate to this verse and determine, do you believe this with all your heart? Psalm 84, 11. Listen to what it says. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. Listen to what it says. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Do you believe that? So, so though we may have problems, though we may have issues, though we may have trouble, adversity, whatever it may be, the Word of God yet says that no good thing will He withhold from them that walk uprightly. So we believe in, once again, the sovereignty of God, that He does whatever is in accordance with His own will, the providence of God, that He determines how He will, he will orchestrate His divine will. And yet here, we have to come to this place where we believe that the Lord is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will He withhold from them that walk uprightly. The condition 
the preposition is that he or she walk uprightly. The promise in this word of the word of God in this this scripture, if that if we walk with integrity, if we walk in the ways of God, that he will actively move on our behalf. Do you believe that? And the last one I'm going to ask you about to, to give you Psalm 34 verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Do you believe that? Though you might have problems, though you might have trouble, though there may be afflictions, it says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. In other words, no matter what happens, no matter what comes, no matter if you find yourself in, the t in these areas of affliction, that there is yet deliverance from that circumstance, that situation, whatever that thing might be in your life. Do you believe that? You see, these are areas that we have to hold on to in order to make it through the circumstances in life, whatever they may be. Now, in expressing to you the attributes of God, we come to the understanding that God is infinite, that he's self-existent. We, we, for, for many, it's, it's hard to understand and comprehend. Well, well, if he is self-existent and he is before all things and in him all things hold together, that he is without origin, then how did he ever come into existence? For many, that's the, that's the, 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 the most perplexing question that they can ask. But I'm come to the realization that I, I simply believe that he is. That it goes beyond my ability to even comprehend. I cannot transcend to this place where I fully understand these areas of God's origin. But I believe in his presence, in his existence, in his word, and in his promises to the people of God. So in other words, I, I don't have to spend time trying to figure everything out for I walk by faith according to the word of God. Here's another one, another, another area, another attribute that I want you to understand. That our God, there's, there, there's a word that is rendered uh, that, that, that sounds very uh, profound, but this word is, is simply immutable. That God is immutable. If, if I simply give it to you in a manner in which we can understand what it means, it simply means that, that God never changes. Our God remains the same. He does not change. He is who he is, and he never changes. His attributes are the same from, from the beginning of time throughout all eternity. His character never changes. He, he, listen, he doesn't in any way improve upon himself. He does not digress in any way. His, he, he, listen, his will, his plans do not change. He is, not, he is immutable. He does not change. In other words, his promises do not change. His word does not change. His plan does not change. Everything that God has established will remain in accordance with his divine nature, his divine plan, and his divine will. He will not change. He's self-sufficient. Do you understand that, that, that our God does not have any needs? He's self-sufficient. Do we understand that God does not necessarily need us to be in fellowship with him, but yet he desires our fellowship. He's self-sufficient. For those people that reject the existence of God, for those people that, that feel as though they would be doing God a, a favor or a service by believing and yielding to him, I'm here to tell you that he does not need any of us, but he chooses relationship with his creation. Understand that is the God that we serve. We come to know that God is all powerful. In Psalm 33, 6, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. There's their starry host by the breath of his mouth. Understand in the book of Job, can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens above. What can you do? They are deeper than the depths below. What can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea. If he comes along and confines you in prison and convenes in accord, who can oppose him? Surely he recognizes deceivers. And when he sees evil, does he not take note in understanding what this is trying to convey? That our God is not only all power, but our God is all-knowing. We know. Those are things that we understand. He, he is omniscient, which simply means he knows everything. 
Listen, whether we can understand or comprehend, the reality is, is that our God can not only be everywhere at the same time, He knows everything at the same time, and He is all powerful. That He, our, do you know that our God never sleeps nor never slumbers? That our God, once again, He is aware, listen, I want you to understand, He is aware of every minute detail in your life. He's aware of every moment of every day. And if we make it personal, yes, you can say that he is aware of every situation and circumstance in which you find yourself in today. He knows every, every single thing there is to know about you. He knows your way. He knows your tendencies. He knows your actions. He knows your typical reactions. There is nothing about us that our God does not know. He knows everything. There's nothing that we can hide from Him. He is all-knowing. He is our God. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. Once again, these are attributes of a God that we, once again, we, 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 we simply understand according to the Word of God that these attributes are, are, are rem, we're reminded of them through His Word. Do you know, people of God, that our God is perfect and has unchanging wisdom? That is our God. Romans eleven thirty three. 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable, unfathomable his ways. That is our God. Now, let me remind you that our God is faithful. Regardless of where you find yourself today, regardless of what you're going through, our God is faithful. From the beginning of the Word of God in Deuteronomy chapter 7, it says this, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is, faith, he is the faithful God, keeping His covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love Him and keep His commandments. Every time you see those verses, you will find that condition, to, to, once again, to those who love Him and keep His commandments. So the promise is in the Word of God. If we find ourselves in that situation, if we love Him, if we keep His commandments, if we walk uprightly, our God is faithful. That is the Word of God. And in once again, in the attributes of God, there is what can be found in Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I can give you that one verse which is, a, which is a, an invitation to anyone who will respond to the Word of God. He is, once again, He's, he's full of kindness. He is full of goodwill. He is, he is everything that we would ever need, ever imagine. His faithfulness trans transcends from His goodness. His mercy flows from His goodness. His grace abounds from His goodwill. But His justice will also prevail from His immutability, His inability to change. He cannot be anything but righteously good. That is the God that we serve. Unchangeably, He was always right. Have you ever questioned God? Oh God, are you sure that this is what's meant to happen in my life? Oh God, oh God, oh God, are, are you sure about this one? I'm here to tell you, if God has ordained, listen, if God has ordained it in your life and you disagree with what has occurred, I'm here to tell you that God is always right. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's already occurred. He knows right where we are. He knows what's ahead. He knows what we will do. There are times when God aligns situations and circumstances to get us right where He desires for us to be for the next area or next phase in our life. He's always right. He's never wrong. Oh, how many believe this morning that our God is once again merciful? He's gracious. He, he doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us what we don't deserve. How many believe that once again, that, that listen, how many believe this morning that the God that we serve is holy? He is holy. You see, I, I've said this numerous times that, that oftentimes in the modern day church, we seem to have forgotten of the holiness of God. That's why we can come into the sanctuary and do whatever we want to do. 
That's why worship today has become more of self-exaltation rather than truly honoring and reverencing a holy God. But our God is holy. That word means that he's sacred, that he's set apart, that he's revered or divine. And yet none of these words adequately describe our God. Understand, people of God, those are simple attributes, profound attributes of the God that we serve. And yet oftentimes we, we come to this place that we forget that truly the God of the Bible is the God who is in control. And so oftentimes we come uh, and we deal with life and life situations based upon how we think situations and circumstances should be. Not understanding the wisdom of God, not understanding the nature of God, not understanding how God allows and, and orchestrates his divine will in our lives individually and how he allows situations to occur. Why? Because he wants to lead us and direct us in the direction that he would have us to go. And because oftentimes we don't respond accordingly, because sometimes we're so inclined to say, I need to be in control. I want to make my own decisions. Even as children of God, oftentimes we're simply led by our own will, our own wants, our own desires. And every now and then God has to allow situations to occur, to lead us in the direction that he would have us to go. To us, we don't understand it. Sometimes we begin to question God. Are you truly in, involved in this situation with me? I don't see how you can be involved because look at all of my problems. Look at all of my, my trials. But, but yet we have to understand the nature and the attributes of our God. And then we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 18, where I want you to hear this verse. Because this is how it all comes together as we read the Word of God and we understand the message of the Word of God. Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For the preaching of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. We preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both the Jews and the Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Did you get that? That is once again in the Word of God. Oftentimes we come to this place where we see how the Word of God is rendered to us and, and how we hear the Word of God and we don't understand those things that occur. But remember in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Here it says, for the preaching of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. So oftentimes we see what God is orchestrating and because we don't understand, because we cannot relate, we look at it as, it, as though it is, the, it is foolishness. But yet, according to the word of God, the Bible says that it is the power of God and wisdom of God as he displays his divine orchestrated master plan. Notice what it says in this verse. For the preaching of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. The preaching, to announce the good news, to, to evangelize the good news, to declare, to bring the good tidings of the cross, that it is foolishness. This word defined simply means silliness, that it is absurdity, that it is foolishness, that they cannot understand. How is it that God comes to humanity and uses the sign of the cross as a way to lead others unto him? Notice what it says once again. To the, both the Jews and the Greeks, once again, it says, it says, but to those who are called both Jews and, and Jews and Greeks, it is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Our knowledge of God says that God knows everything perfectly. Do you believe that? I want, you to, I want you to, in the recesses of your own mind, determine as to how you respond to what you know of this God of the Bible. God knows everything. The sovereignty of God says that God is the supreme ruler of the universe, that he is in control. No, listen, I want, you, I want to, to some, I want you to understand that truly it is God who is the supreme ruler of the universe. To some, it might be a revelation that it is not the president of the United States who is the supreme ruler of the universe. It is the God that we serve. 
Though this world does not fully understand what we come to know as the truths of God, it is all in His Word. The holiness of God tells us that He is the sum of all moral excellence in whom there is no imperfection or lack of wholeness. There is no imperfection in the holiness of God. The power of God, that he ha it, it tells us that He has the ability and the strength to bring to pass whatsoever He pleases. The power of God. The patience of God is that He understands our humanity and He gives us free will to get it right. Aren't you grateful that He understands your humanity? I, I don't know if there's anyone here that has ever truly understood and appreciated once again that the patience of God is, is, is so... Oh, how many of you say, I, need, I have needed the patience of God in my life? Aren't you grateful today? Come on now, to people of God, is there anyone here today that can acknowledge it? I'm so grateful that God was patient with me. The patience of God. Understand that He understands you. He understands your nature. He understands how you were created. He knows everything there is to know about you. And yet, once again, because of His patience, He allows us to continue to Allow us to make our own decisions. That's the God that we serve. The grace of God, that He willingly gives us what we do not deserve. Do you know, people of God, that we do not deserve what God has ordained for us? Once again, the grace simply means that we, that we get what we don't deserve. And the mercy of God, that He does not give us what do we do deserve? I'd venture to say, let, let me see if any of you agree with me. If most of us got what we deserved from God, I believe that this probably would be an empty building today. Would you agree? Listen, let me go to the next, next point. The justice of God says that everyone gets exactly what they deserve. Do you believe that? That is the justice of God. But here, what I want you to understand is that, is that according to His infinite wisdom, it tells us that He chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Those things that, that, that humanity might, not, not, might never understand, how is it that God can use that situation? How is it that God could ever use them? How is it that God could ever use that to confound the wise? They don't fully understand. But the Bible says that God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound those things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised. God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. In other words, listen, did he hear, to, to someone, this is a revelation that God can use what the world despises. How many know today that, that, that many of us would never measure up in the eyes of other people? But I'm here to tell you that yet in the eyes of God, He can use what others perceive as being foolishness and use that situation, that person, for His glory. That's the God that we serve. So with that in mind, the Bible tells us that He uses the weak things, those esteemed weak by the people of the world. The, 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 the mighty are defined as the great and the noble, and God uses all of these things in accordance with His, his divine master plan. So with that in mind, I want, you, I want to remind you, listen to, to, according to the foolishness, perceived foolishness, and that is not to say that God is foolish. That is simply to say is that that is how it is received and how people respond to what they believe according to the knowledge of God, that it is foolishness. That's why in 1 Corinthians, once again, in verse 8, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved, it is the power of God. What can be perceived as the foolishness of God in reality is the perfect, precise, and powerful plan of God. So with that in mind, to those it might be foolishness that, 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 God, that God brought His Son into the world, that He has Him born in a stable instead of some palace or castle somewhere around the way, that it is foolishness, that, that that must be foolishness of God, that if this is truly the Son of God, He would not be born in those conditions. But what I want you to understand is, is that sometimes we question the manner in which our God orchestrates the situations in life. And there, there are times that even you and I might consider it, a God, are you sure about this? Lord, Lord, are you sure this is how it's meant to be? Listen, the nation of Israel 
They were looking for a Messiah, but not one who would be a suffering servant. They, they were looking for a deliverer. They were waiting for someone, a conquering savior that would come and overthrow the Roman government. They were waiting, waiting for the, the lion king who would roar out against the, the Roman and, and the oppression all around them. The Messiah they were expecting would repeat the deliverance that occurred when they left in Egypt and they were delivered in the Exodus. They were expecting a deliverer. A crucified Christ or Messiah was not what they were expecting. As a matter of fact, to them, it did not make sense. They couldn't understand how is it that God could deliver us from this, this so-called Savior who is now hanging on a cross. How can that be? It, listen, if anyone believes that, that is foolishness, for God would never do something like this. See, after all, crucifixion was reserved for criminals, for convicted murderers, for rebellious people, for those that were insurrections. How could the Messiah ever be hung on a cross? Understand, that's offensive to us. We can't understand it. Now, they, they, they knew that curse was that man that was to hang on a tree. And now this man is hanging on a tree and you're expecting us to believe that he is the coming Messiah. Foolishness. There's no way that that can happen. For they had been taught and believed that one day their Messiah would come and deliver them in their situation and establish them as the nation that all nations would respond to. How is it that this happens? And, this, and you're telling me that he is the Messiah and there he is nailed to a cross? Foolishness. That was their perspective. See, it was in their mind that mind foolish to think that, that Jesus was the one. Yes trying to tell us that, that he's the one that came to set us free, that he's the one that, to come to be our king, our, our deliverer. And look at him now. Look at him now. Foolishness. How could this be? You see, from their perspective, they believe that they would see it a certain way, that we would occur in a certain manner. They never expected to be anything other than what they believed would occur. And it was all foolishness to them to think that that was possible, much less probable. That the cross was foolishness to others. But you and I know that though it may be foolishness to others, that to you and to me, it is the powerful truth of the Word of God. We know. The world, listen, the world all around us does not believe in, 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 in what we are, are even expressing to you this morning. That Jesus came to set the captive free. That he came to live his life to, for the glory of the Father. That for anyone who believes in him can respond to him and now would be in right standing with God. Foolishness, they say. How can that be? Christ crucified. How can that be? But you and I look at it from this perspective, that it is the power of God. Do you understand, people of God, that Christ crucified is the power of God, that Christ is the power of God, that Christ is the wisdom of God. By the means of the cross, God does for man what man cannot do for himself. By the means of the cross, God disarms the powers of darkness. By the means of the cross, God brought potential deliverance to all humanity. By the cross, by the means of the cross, God, God buys man's freedom from sin. That is the powerful truth of the cross. But to others, it is foolish. Foolishness. Aren't you grateful today that you understand the truth of the power of the cross? That God saves people who put their faith in a crucified Christ. It is the power of God. Understand, people of God, there, there, you must understand that there are numerous times that God superseded the wisdom of man and used what could be received as foolishness decisions in his word. And foolish calling, understanding that, that these situations, he used foolish, what, what we would perceive as foolishness, as foolish decisions, as foolish calling to fulfill his plan and his purpose. I've come to learn that that is often how, times how, how God operates. Do you remember, do you remember how, how God used Moses who was intimidated, who was fearful, who was afraid to speak. 
But, but understand, because of that situation, under, those situations would present. How can God use him? He was unqualified. To many, it would have been foolishness. Because you must understand that, that un, under those conditions, what it truly did was qualify him to be used of God. What others would perceive as, as foolishness, God uses as a, as, a, as a means to determine how someone will be dependent upon him. And here you see, all over the word of God, there are these examples, situations, situations that occurred based upon what we would perceive as foolishness. Remember, remember how God used David. The young shepherd boy, the, the, this young, he became what we come to know as the greatest king of the nation of Israel. Once perceived as unqualified, insignificant, overlooked. He was an overlooked teenage boy, boy or brother or son. But, but yet God used that situation to stand against their greatest adversary. To his family, it would have been considered foolishness. But to God, he identified the man who would be king. To many, it's foolishness. Re remember, remember the day when, 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 when Gideon was going to conquer the oppressing army and how God allowed his numbers to become dwindled to a very small number to defeat the oppression. oppression. Some would say foolishness. How is it, God, you had more, you had numbers, but there are those who are afraid, and yet God used that situation to display himself through that circumstance. Others would perceive it as foolishness, but yet we see it was the plan of God. God chooses seemingly insignificant situations, means, and people to display that he is God. It's a principle in the word of God. There was a time that God the Father commissioned Isaiah. Tell me if you think that this would be a foolish command. That he gave Isaiah the command to walk around naked for three years. That's in the word of God. How many would say, what foolishness? Now, now someone might hear my be, be, say, well, I don't think that's too foolish. Well, let me ask you this question. What would you do? If that was you from that perspective, there are things that occur in the word of God that we can't understand. But God, why is it that it is in your word? Because God displays who he is, his nature, his symbolism, all about him through what he ordains and orchestrates in his divine will. And he commanded this man to do this very thing. And it displayed the very nature of the nation as it was in despondency and despair for their rebellion and for their, their lack of obedience to the things of God. All over the word of God, there are these situations, circumstances that you can find. Uh, foolishness of, listen, listen, what some might perceive as the foolishness of God, listen, do you understand that God, that Jesus Christ called 12 disciples to change the world? 12 disciples that were uneducated fishermen there was a tax collector, and he didn't come to the religious leaders of the day. He did not come to the wealthy. He came to, to, to 12 unqualified men to change the world. Some would say, how foolish could he have been? But it was the plan of God. Even the apostle Paul. You see, according to what we've learned in the Word of God, he had physical impediments. He had physical limitations. Uh, he, the Bible says he was not a skilled speaker, and he bore marks of all, all that he had gone through. And, and you might listen to him. He says, I, I can't really speak. And then somebody, well, the foolishness of God to choose that man, but yet that man goes on to write most of the New Testament epistles. What some would perceive as the foolishness of God was God using his plan, his master plan, to use that person that he had ordained. Well, why am I going here today? Because I want you to understand even today how in situations and circumstances, even in our lives, we might not see how God is moving. We might not understand it. We, we, we might not know how God uses uh, his, his, his divine master plan to work out his divine will in our lives, but it's all over the word of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, listen to what it says. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. 
Oh, yes, oh, society would tell you, well, that person is qualified, or, or that person is, is this, and that person is that. They're the ones, they're the ones. Even, listen, you can go back even into the Word of God and find how that was actually described in the Word of God. Remember Samuel, when he was told to go and find the next king of the nation of Israel, he goes and he sees the brothers of David, and because of their appearance, he assumed that they would be the one. But the Bible says that that's not how God operates. He doesn't operate by the standards of men. He goes by the condition of the heart, what he knows about that person, that heart. And the Bible says that, that, that here, that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Oftentimes that is so profound. You see, that, 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 that God does not pick people like we would by our criteria. By, by, by saying like Samuel, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. He did not many pick many people, uh, once again, by their, their great natural abilities or their tendency. He did not pick many mighty or able people. No, no, understand. To the contrary, instead, God lovingly, he, he leads and he imparts ability to those who had nothing to offer. Those that would seem unqualified, those that seem that, that everyone else will say, there is nothing about that person that God could use. Yet God specializes in using those people for his glory. It's all in the word of God. Once again, there was Moses, there was David, there was Abraham. Abraham is called the father of faith, but his greatest weakness, you understand? Uh, listen, Abraham was called the father of faith, but do you know what Abraham's greatest weakness was? Lack of faith, foolishness. How is it that God could call this man and he be deemed as the, the father of faith, yet he lacked faith. The foolishness of God, it must be. Gideon, there was Peter. Remember, Jesus called Peter a rock, but he was not what he would eventually be. Peter, Peter was impulsive. Peter was violent. Peter thought that he could do what he thought he would do, but in the, mind, the time of, 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 of duress, all of a sudden he realized that he was not able to do what he was claiming that he would do. And, and listen, and don't, 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 don't make him mad. Listen, don't, don't, don't threaten to arrest Jesus while Peter's there with his knife, or you might walk away without an ear. That is Peter. But yet God uses people just like Peter. A man with a temper. A man who could not control his emotions. Over and over and over again, you see these individuals that God has selected for his purpose. Why is it that Jesus selected Peter? Not because of where he was, not because of where he, what he had done, not because of who he claimed to be, but God selected Peter because Jesus knew who Peter would become. You and I are selected not because of all that we offer, we're not selected by God because of all of our mess ups in our lives. God knows, listen, I, the, the sovereignty of God, the all knowingness of God, He knows everything there is to know about you. He knows where you've blown it, He knows how you've messed up. He knows everything there is to know, yet He yet selected you. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that Jesus did not judge me by who I was. What I used to do, how I used to be. That he didn't come and call me when I was at a place where I could be used by him. He came and found me at my worst condition where I was not living for his glory, where I was not trying to make a difference for him, where my, my head was so far away. But in the middle of being so far away, he had identified me as someone that he would try to draw unto himself by his spirit. Not because of my mess ups, but because in his own knowingness, he knew that I would respond. And he knew the moment I would respond, I would surrender my heart to him. And that's not to say that I didn't make mistakes along the way. That's not to say that I did not blow it along the way because there were times when I blew it along the way. 
But the patience of God said, I'm going to wait for him. I'm not giving up on him. He kept drawing me and drawing me, giving me dreams. When I wasn't paying attention to him in, in my consciousness, he would wait till I fell asleep and then he would give me dreams in the middle of the night before I ever knew that I would stand behind a podium and proclaim the word of God. He gave me dreams and visions of doing this very thing right now that I'm doing right now. I wasn't qualified. I didn't have the credentials. I didn't have the confidence. I didn't have the faith. And my problem was that I, I had faith in everything but the faith of the knowledge of God who he knew what he was doing and he was not going to make a mistake. Why? Because I did not realize that he was perfect and he's always right. That in spite of my looking at myself saying, you're no good, you're not qualified, look at your life, look at your situation, and you think God could ever use you, he looked beyond my faults, saw my needs, and says, I'm going to use him. Foolishness to people. But it is the power and the wisdom of God. That he can look at you right where you are. In your condition. In your messed up life. And seemingly always in your mind saying, why did I fail again? Why did I fail again? Why did I fail? But yet he knows your heart. And as long as you continue, listen. You give him something by the spirit to hold on to your life. He's not going to give up on you. He's not going to give up on you. By virtue, brother, by virtue of you being here right now tells me that God is not giving up on you. That's the God that we serve. He's chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Oh, you don't qualify. You have flaws. I've said this to you in the past, my, my life, there are times when I, I won't see, I haven't seen someone for 30, 40 years. I run into them, see someone I haven't seen in 40 years. And at the moment they see me, oh yes, I remember you. Didn't you used to? Ever been there before? Ever been to a place where someone reminds you of how you blew it in your life, how you messed up in your life, how you were not good or what you used to? Have you ever been there before in that situation? But I don't know about you people of God, but I'm so grateful that I can look at them straight in the eye with the love of God and say to them, brother or sister, I want you to understand that it was then, then, and this is now. The person that you used 40, you knew 40 years ago, from a spiritual perspective, it no longer exists. That person is dead to the glory of God. Understand, people of God, because we are who we are in Christ, we die to self and we live for the glory of God, that we're not who we used to be, that we are now someone who God has now established for us to be in His creation, in His through His mandate, and as we surrender and submit everything to Him, He uses us for His glory. Aren't you grateful? Come on, somebody. Aren't you grateful that that is the God that we serve? Can, can, can you imagine? Listen, well, 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 how can you say that? Look at her. Look at her. How can God ever use that? Look at how she blew it. I'm here to tell you, even if you have blown it, I'm here to tell you that when you come to Jesus, when you repent of your sins, when you ask for forgiveness, that same God by his spirit will come and live within you. He will cleanse you. He will change you. He will set you straight. He will put you on a solid ground. And I'm here to tell you, when you begin to live your life for Jesus, your life will never, ever, 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 ever be the same somebody knows what I'm talking about somebody knows what I'm somebody knows what I'm talking about to many foolishness but to us it's the power of God I'm so grateful when I read in the word of God all these men and flaws that these men had in the word of God because I can relate to some of them but I know not everyone here can because I know a lot of you are maybe watching or just you, 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 you've arrived and you've made it there and you don't have any flaws and you don't have any issues. You don't contend with temptation or sin because you're right there where you need to be. Praise God if that's you. But I'm here to tell you, it's not me. 
So if it's you and you want to come and trade places with me, come on, here's your chance. Here's your chance. How many, how many can relate to what I'm saying today? The foolishness of God. Listen to what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Because here's the good news, particularly to anyone, and the heart of this message is, is even inclined to, to say that the foolishness of God, what others may perceive as foolishness, it is part of his plan. Someone here today might say, but, but good, listen, that sounds good, uh, you're, you're talking good, but uh, I, I don't, if God, you saying that God can use me not only sounds foolishness to me, like foolishness to me, it is foolish. Because I, I don't think God can ever use me. You know, I, I, I come and I sit in the pew and, and you see me come and go, I really don't say much to anyone, but I come and I sit down. But you really don't know my struggles. You really don't know what I contend with when I leave through these doors, you don't know. So don't try to tell me that, because I know, here's the problem, I know. I know where I fall short. I, I know how I sit. I, I know how I struggle in this area of temptation. I know, and so don't, don't tell me that God can use me because I know. But I'm here to tell you that there is good news in the Word of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, it says this, nevertheless, the, the solid foundation of God stands, having the seal, the seal, listen to what it says. The Lord knows those who are His. Do you understand that, that, that the Lord does not keep us in covenant with Him based upon who we are or what we've done or even what we do? Uh, listen, the, the, He keeps us in covenant with Him based upon our relationship with the Son of God. On, and we're, we, maybe we're not there yet. Maybe we're not totally surrendered and submitted and committed. But, but, but maybe we're, we're, we're in somewhat of a relationship. I'm here to tell you, He knows who is His. He knows. His patience, he will not give up on you. Listen, the only way, the, the, the only way that, that he would ever in any way, and in any way, is sim you simply begin to reject who he is. If you ever reach this place in your life where you say, Jesus, I don't believe in you. I don't want you. I don't want to live my life for your glory. I'm here to tell you, the spirit of the living God is still going to try to draw you to Jesus. The person that makes that decision to no longer serve Jesus, it's not Jesus rejecting you. It's you rejecting him. He won't give up on you. He, he, he won't let you go. Even in that time when you were surrendering your life to Jesus and you're giving, oh, oh I was on fire. I was on fire. I felt his presence. I, I felt him all around me. And I was living for him. And I, and I was just really enjoying my relationship with him. But then something happened. Someone came into my life that distracted me. Maybe there's a problem on the job. Maybe something, maybe you lost your job. Maybe all of a sudden you began to have trouble and trial and you didn't know how you were going to make it. And all of a sudden you started focusing on your problems. And now you, 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 because of life, you've forgotten about Jesus. Now you're looking at life. I'm here to tell you, he is still seeking you to come back to him. All over the word of God. There are examples of how God uses unqualified, what we would perceive as foolish. To orchestrate his will. Pastor David, uh, once again, it sounds good. But the only reason you can say that is because you have not gone through what I'm going through. Because you really don't understand my loss. You don't understand my pain. You don't understand how I hurt because of what happened. You don't understand, Pastor David. You could say all the right things, but you don't understand me. You don't understand what I go through. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus does. He knows. And in spite of how bad it may be and how it may seem, he can use your situation, no matter what it is, to receive glory from you. Doesn't matter what it is. 
Do you understand for that person who says, but, but listen, I was there, I, 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 was, I was there, I was there, I was there. But then I walked away. And now I'm ashamed. Because they're going to talk about me. They're going to, they know, they know, they know my life. They know how, what happened, and, and I'm ashamed now because the saddest testimony is, is, is that person who has fallen short of the glory of God. The, the, the saddest testimony of the, the church of God is to say that any person would feel uh, uncomfortable coming back into the house of God because they would feel as though they're going to be criticized and talked about even in the house of God. I'm here to tell you, people of God, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how you've fallen. It doesn't matter how you failed. If you come into the house of God, I'm here to tell you that you will feel the love of Jesus in this place. Because I'm not here to criticize and judge you. I'm not here to cream on you. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to help you into a loving relationship with Jesus Christ in spite of where you have been, in spite of what you have done, in spite of where you are and where you're going. I'm here to lead you to Jesus. That one day you fall so much in love with him that it doesn't matter what's happened in your life because now you're in love with Jesus. Over and over and again, what's in the Word of God? There's so many examples I could give you. So many that I have here, but because of the brevity of time, I can't give it all to you. In John 1, listen to these words. I've not gotten to the point where I say, okay, okay, today I'm not, I'm not going to weep. Today, today I'm not going to have to blow my nose because I'm, I'm weeping. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> but I'm here to lead you to Christ. That you may know the depths of his love. That what you perceive as heartache is pain. What others may perceive as foolish is how God could ever do this because of this. That you can see beyond that situation and see Jesus. John 1, listen to what it says, John 1 verse 9. That it was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. The nation of Israel didn't respond. They couldn't believe it. It's foolishness. Jesus coming to, that's foolishness. Don't, don't, no, we don't believe that. But notice what it says. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Did you hear that? But as many has received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God. How many have you received him in this place today? How many have received him? You received him, you received him. He's given you the power to become the son and daughter of the living God. Understand what depends on people, God, what, oh, according to his word. I want you to know and understand that no matter what you're experiencing, no matter what you're going through, that our God is yet in control. He knows your life. He knows your situations. He knows everything there is to know about you. Someone may say to you, to you, Don't, well, you you're foolish to think that God is involved in your situation. I'm here to tell you that's a foolish statement to make. Because I'm here to tell you that if you're a child of God, if you're, if you're truly a child of God, then God is involved in your life. He, he knows. He's involved. There are times where even now that I'm crying out to the Lord in certain areas for, for my life, for, for, for this ministry. And I have to remind it, Lord, you know, you know. You already know where, where we're headed. You know, you know what's happening. You know where we're going. You know our abundance. You know our lack. You know our needs. Lord, you know. So I have to trust what I know about the God that I know.
Just let me remind you, if you're here today and you're going through situations and you're going through circumstances and you don't think that God is involved in your life and it's foolish to even think that that's part of the case because it seems so bad. I'm here to tell you that it doesn't matter if it's bad. Our God can yet receive glory from your badness or your situation. Doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter if you look at yourself, well, once again, God, how can you ever use me? I'm foolish to even think that that's the case. That could happen. It doesn't matter what problems you have, even now. It doesn't matter, listen, it doesn't matter if you look at yourself and say, well, somewhere along the line I made bad decisions and where would I be if I would have done it this way? I don't have the education, I don't have the job. I don't know how I'm gonna make it. It's foolish to think that I can make it. I'm here to tell you none of that matters. I'm here to tell those of you who have felt lack of acceptance from others that though others rejected you because they looked at you as being foolish and they looked at you a certain way or whatever the case may be, though others may not have accepted you, I'm here to tell you that Jesus will accept you no matter what your condition, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how you measure up to everyone else on this side of heaven, he will receive you just how you are. The foolishness of God is that he has chosen us to confound the wisdom of man. He's chosen you to profess and to proclaim to others the reality of the God of the Bible who has all these attributes. He's chosen you. He's chosen you. You might not yet be acting upon being chosen by God for this purpose, but he's chosen you. We might look at ourselves, at ourselves and wonder how someone like us could be used to do anything for the cause of Christ. I'm here to tell you, if I had held on to that mentality, I would never be here today. Because if there was ever anyone who was unqualified to be used of God and to preach his word, it's me. And I'm not ashamed to admit that because it's true. But I also know the redemption of God, of God. And I know the forgiveness of God. I understand the restoration of God. And to those that come to him, to anyone who comes to him, he will give the power to become a son or daughter of the living God. That's the God that we serve. So I want you to understand that he doesn't need you to be perfect. He doesn't need you. As a matter of fact, the word in the word perfect that we read in the Bible in reality oftentimes means complete. He wants us to be complete. He doesn't expect us to be perfect in our vernacular because none of us are there. In reality, let me give you some hope here, somebody. He doesn't need to be you to be all that when you come to him. <laughs> he wants us to be, in essence, weak in our own disposition, in who we are, recognizing that we are in such desperate need of him so weak that we must become totally dependent upon him and his power. 
That's what he wants from us. That, that he's looking for people who have nothing more than faith and a desire to cling to him. He's looking for someone that'll say, I, I, I can't do this on my own. I can't make it on my own. When I try, I mess it all up. I've tried it and I messed it up. He's looking for people to say, I, I've done it. I've been there. I've done that. I've made all these mistakes. My life is all messed up. I, I, I'm weak right where I am. I have no power. I have no strength on my own. He's looking for those that will come to him saying, Jesus, you're everything that I need, and I can no longer do this on my own. I need you. I need you. I want to surrender everything to you, Jesus. I want to submit everything to you. I want to commit everything to you and, and understand that everything else, Jesus, is no longer important to me. I want to be what you want me to be. That is what he's looking for through you, from you. The world, once again, will tell you that you and I coming to church on Sunday morning is foolishness. You know that. The system of the world will tell you because you believe in God, you're a fool. That's what the world will tell you. The world is being inspired and led by the forces of the evil one. Know your opposition. Our knowledge of God says that God knows everything perfectly and completely. To the world, that's foolishness. But to you and me, it is the power of God. I wonder if someone can help me close out this sermon. The sovereignty of God says that God is the supreme ruler of the universe. To the world, that is foolishness. But to you and to me, that is the power of God. The holiness of God tells us that he is the sum of all excellence in whom there is no imperfection or lack of wholeness and completeness. To the world, that is foolishness. But to you and to me, that's the power of God. The power of God tells us that he has the ability and the strength to bring to pass whatsoever he pleases. To the world, that's foolishness. To you and to me, that is the power of God. Oh, I don't think I have a witness today. The patience of God says that he understands our humanity and gives us free will to get it right. The patience of God. The world says that is foolishness. To you and to me, that is the power of God. The grace of God says that he willingly gives us what we do not deserve. To the world, that is foolishness. To you and to me, that is the power of God. The mercy of God says that he does not give us what we deserve. To the world, that is foolishness. To you and to me, come on somebody, that is the power of God. Listen, listen, the justice of God says that everyone gets exactly what we deserve. The world says that is foolishness. Now, before I said it is the power of God, this is what I'm going to inject. To the world that says that there is no God, I'm here to tell that person, I'm here to tell you that, that, that there is no existence of God and that it's foolishness. I'm here to tell you because of that statement, one day you will see how foolish you are to have ever thought that there is no God. I'm here to tell you that though you might think it is the foolishness to summon, I'm here to tell you that that is the justice of God. That is the power of God. That's the God that we serve. So what do we say? Remember, whatever you're going through right now, and you don't think God can work through that situation, I'm here to remind you that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. That God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound, confound the things which are mighty. That the base things of the world and the th things which are despised has God chosen, yes, and the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. I'm here to remind you, people of God, that our God is yet in control. Why does he do this? Why does he use the foolishness, things, the foolishness of life that no flesh should glory in his presence? 
But let me remind you, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. I don't know if there's anyone here today that is grateful that because of Jesus, we are found righteous in the sight of God. Because of Jesus, we have been sanctified. I don't know if there's anyone here that says, I'm sanctified. I'm sanctified. I'm set apart for the purposes of God. And that there is redemption in the things of God. I don't know if there's anyone here, Brother Brother Corey, I don't know if there's anyone here that agrees with me that says, I know that our God is good. Come on now. I know that our God is good. So here, what I'm going to say to you once again, it all starts with Jesus. You must assess where you are now. And if Jesus is not the forefront of your life, I'm here to tell you, yet while he has not yet returned, there's still time. But I'm here to tell you that we don't know how much time we have. You don't know how much time you have. Oh, that person, well, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. Then I'm going to get it right with Jesus. I'm here to tell you, people of God, or those of you that are here that are not people of God, I'm here to tell you, you do not know how much time you have. Today is the day of salvation. This moment is the moment of salvation. This time is you have the opportunity to say, Jesus, here I am. I give myself to you. I give my heart to you. Though I don't understand everything, though I don't comprehend everything, though I don't know everything, I'm going to trust you, Jesus, because I know that you are in control. And if you're having problems and you don't know what to do, and you've gone through some things and you don't know why, how can God, how, oh, don't tell me that because look at my life. Listen, how can God ever work in this situation? I'm here to tell you, maybe he's using that situation to lead you into a deeper revelation of the love of the son of God. What will you do? Maybe you're going through some difficult times. Maybe you're going through the fires in life. I'm here to tell you people of God, it's up to you to determine how you respond. But I'm telling you people of God, our God is good. Our God is good. Come on, anyone else agree with me that our God is good? How many say, I want Jesus. I want, listen, listen. Keep on singing, brother. Don't stop. How many would say, I'd rather have Jesus than religion? Come on now. How many would say, I'd rather have Jesus than the, than, than, than the biggest, best church in this, in this city? I'd rather have Jesus. How many would say, I'd rather have Jesus than, than a third Super Bowl of the Kansas City Chiefs? Come on now. How many say, I'd rather have Jesus? Come on now. How many would say, I'd rather have Jesus than anything in my life? Because if you do, I'm here to tell you, he'll lead you. He'll guide you. He'll change you. And if there's anything wrong in your life that shouldn't be here, I'm here to tell you, he'll start getting those things right in God. If you let him be the Lord of your life. That is the God that we serve. The foolishness of, God, of the world says, nah, listen, he's just wasting your time. But to you and to me, we know that it is the power of the living God. How many believe that today? That the gospel is of the word of God is the power of the word of God. I don't know about you people, but I'm so happy that I'm a child of God. Every now and then I want to just jump and shout and dance because I'm so happy. Go ahead, brother. Keep on singing. Go ahead and sing. Listen to this song and believe this song for yourself. Listen, listen, listen to this song. And you can stand to your feet and you can, you can dance, you can, you can clap your hands. Listen, if you want to, you can cry. If you need a tissue, I'll give you one. I don't know if that's you, but listen, we need to celebrate the fact that we are children of the living God. Let's sing this song like we mean it. how you told me that I can trust you completely. So why am I doubting? Pull me through fire Pull me from flames If you're in this with me I won't be afraid When the smoke 